Thanks, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here in Frankfurt, where I'm actually based. My accent betrays me. I'm Italian, but I will be based in Frankfurt. And um, as I was announced, I'm a member of the IBM Industry Academy and I act as a global thought leader for fintech. What does it mean? It means that I try to bring around the table the players of technology, like Finastra. I bring the regulators, it's always important. The world of the fintech entrepreneurs, they try to change the system. The venture capitalists, the investors, because we need money. But if you like, what is special today is that I want to bring around the table you, yourself. Because Silicon Valley made a fundamental mistake in understanding the psychology of the banking client. Therefore, if we don't restart from there, we don't understand how to make money out of digital innovation. So the fintech revolution is, first and foremost, a revolution of the business model of the financial institutions. The clients, each and every body of us, take center stage, not the product anymore. And if you change the way you make money, you need to use different technology in order to deliver value to your respective customers. So we are going to do a few things today, and I want to give you an interpretation of uh, the three stories I want to share with you. First of all, we will start from the United States, we go through Europe, and we land in China. I've been continuously traveling for IBM, like uh, 100 keynotes worldwide from Australia to Alaska, if you take that route. And I think that we can divide the world uh, to simplify in three different macro areas. The first one is the United States, where technology was born. Now Chinese are getting very competitive and aggressive. But typically, technology is born in the United States. Europe, we love regulation. It's part of the European Commission construct because we need to harmonize the countries. And mind, regulation is very important to make sure that innovation is sustained innovation. But China, China is uh, the fintech leader because China has the business model. And you need to start from the business model, understand how to scale it with technology, and make sure it's part of a good regulatory framework to transform an industry that does something good for the clients, therefore remains sustainable. Second consideration before we deep dive into the three stories. I know some of you come from payment, or from risk, or from a corporate, or from investment banking, well management. You can take two routes to understand my presentation today. We are going to talk a lot about well management to start with, your money, because it has the secret sauce to digitize the full bank. Then you can move out of well management into corporate banking. I design open banking platform for SME in IBM. And then you have an idea of how to digitize the full bank or, which will be towards the end of the presentation, you can start from digital payments. You understand from digital payments and big data how to get into digital advice, and then you have a model for digitizing the full bank. Are you with me? Good. So now, these are the three stories of today. You see, this is the only time where I didn't have a beard in my life, a very early stage. And the three stories correspond to three buzzwords. I want to demystify these buzzwords because they've been used and abused by the industry commentators, the fintech entrepreneurs, and the media. The first one is disruption. Everyone talks about disruptive innovation. But you know what? Disruption is not important if you don't have a way out of disruption. The second story is about digital. Digital is cool, right? It's sexy. But digital is a pool technology, demand-driven, while well, most of the banking services operate in a push economy, offer driven. If you don't make sense out of that, we don't make return on investment. And the third story is unbundling. The fintech trying to unbundle the bank into smaller pieces, but guess what? Only bundling makes sense, because on digital, only platforms win. All of this goes under the title of the digitization of knowledge to scale competence, and I hope we reveal through these stories why this is the late motive of the presentation today. So far, so good? So we get into the first story, the one of disruption. Now, this is the City Digital Disruption Report published in 2016 that forecasts that by 2025, 50% of jobs in the financial services will be gone. Are there bankers in the room? Raise the hand. Okay, all of the bankers on this side move to this side because these jobs are gone, please. <laughs> Just move. <laughs> now, it doesn't really matter to me whether this is uh, the right number, 45, 55, 60 percent, that is not the point. We know that the banking industry is already disrupted, 
and is going through a very thorough and painful process of reorganization. Is this due to technology? Is this because of artificial intelligence and digital? I don't think so. I don't know what you had this morning for breakfast, but I was served an orange juice made of freshly squeezed margins. Since the height of the global financial crisis in 2008, something happened. The regulators had to lift the cost of capital to create their risking in the banking portfolios. They had to push a lot of money into the economy that led the interest rate to drop negative in Germany. Basically, it's very difficult for banks to make money out of the interest rate margin. So what banks thought of doing was to move towards the intermediation margin. That means two things. Payments accounts for 20% of revenues for global banking. But guess what? Digital payments are instantaneous, low margin. Five years from now, that business will be very, very difficult to generate money with. The second pillar is wealth management, investment products and insurance products. But hey, we got regulation, we got a MIFI too, we got transparency. So transparency is lifting up, unveiling the king that is naked, and therefore the margins are due to go down. This is the year of the costing charges exposed. So you see that the cost income of banks has troubles because the business model of banks these days does not comply anymore with the business environment that they are working with. Now, if this is my point of view, I want to share the voice of some of the people that I managed to meet uh, in my career, and I report here only those which are public conversations. The first one is uh, Frederico Dea, the chief ex um, executive officer of Societe Generale. We were sitting together at Paris FinTech Forum two years ago. And what Frederic said is the following. He said, what happens to banks in the Western world is a transformation from transactions to services, which in my simple language means uh, making money by selling products with embedded fees into packaging those products in a mechanism called advice and asking the clients to pay for that transparently. Now, Sophia Merlot, the co-CEO of Bain Paper Bowel Management, spoke after me and said, well, you know, we asked uh, the French clients if they want to pay for advice, and they said, uh, pas du tout, nine, <laughs> right? But we want to do that because it is in our DNA and because the regulators are asking us to do that with the MIFI too. Now, if you move on the other side of the Atlantic, I was sitting with Larry Fink at the Morning Star Conference in Chicago last year. Larry is the CEO of BlackRock, a powerhouse of investment management, trillions of dollars, a product maker. So what Larry said is that five years from now, he wants 30% of BlackRock revenues to come from solutions. That means moving technology to the front end where the relationship with the client occurs in order to make sure that those type of revenues can be supported. So if this is the real essence of today's challenge and transformation, what is FinTech? FinTech is not the reason. FinTech is the opportunity for the banking charter and the insurance charter to move from a transactional type of business model into a service advice oriented type of business model where revenues are generated in a completely different way. But then, what is innovation? Well, there are three types of innovation. One we're not talking about today, which is blockchain, that is foundational innovation, changes the infrastructure of the economy. There are two more types of innovation we need to consider. Disruptive innovation, sustaining innovation. The only graph of today, sustaining innovation is the yellow line from the theory of Clayton Christensen. You have a product, you make it better and better every year, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and then you invite your clients to buy the new product or you create you know, a premium product or a simple product. But one day comes where your clients don't understand your product anymore. That's when disruption can occur. Not because somebody comes with a better product, but because your client doesn't understand your product anymore. But then Clayton says, if we look 10 years after the disruption point, only those companies that went back to sustaining innovation remained alive. The others disappeared. And I think that there are also companies that try to make a very different journey, which is the red dotted line that goes from today complexity of the industry into a new added value level of the industry without going through disruption. I know this is a very complex topic to digest today after the break, but I, I would like to use a cartoon so that we can simplify it and bring it back home. 
the one with the beard that said Ismina, right? So this is 25 years ago, 30 years ago in Milan, where I'm based, actually, where I was born. And uh, my father came back home for my birthday with uh, a CD player. You remember the CD player? It's already vintage. I used to listen to music with a tape recorder. Now, the CD player was an example of sustaining innovation. It was very expensive. I'm happy that Daddy could afford it. And every year I was buying into a new piece of uh, technology to build my hi-fi architecture. I bought the loudspeakers, the subwoofer, the equalizer. I don't know if you did the same, but I bought at the end the fiber optic cables. You remember them? To wire these hi-fi to get God knows what in terms of extra quality to listen to the music. I saturated. I didn't know why I had to spend 1,000 more euros in order to buy the extra piece of my pioneer hi-fi. What about banks before the global financial crisis? If you think about their banking architecture, they had all sorts of products on display. Bonds, structured bonds, uh, uh, mortgage-based securities, uh, securitizations, uh, subprime products, uh, funds, uh, target funds, uh, formula funds, uh, futures, options, uh, derivatives, uh, uh, whatever, edge funds, so on and so forth. A day came when the regulators, in the name of the clients, did not understand the value of these products anymore. You can hardly find those products. They generated a lot of revenues on the shelves of the open banking architectures today. But then, if we go back to the music industry, at the time when I saturated my needs, Steve Jobs did something amazing. Right at the time, he put the iTunes on the Mac and started selling the iPod. Do you remember the iPod? The iPod was not better music. Was it better music? Not really. But it was cool, was whenever, was whatever, was cheap. Maybe 100 euros, I don't remember exactly. So I bought it, everybody bought it. And the music industry got changed. Do you know the robo-advisors? Is a robo-advisor better than a relationship manager in a bank? I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe not. It really depends. But that is not the point. The point is that if I don't understand the value proposition of my bank anymore, one day can come when I decide that to onboard on a simpler and different solution, and the game is over. But if you go to the Apple store today in Frankfurt, you don't find the iPod anymore. It's already passé. What you find is my wonderful iPhone which is sustaining innovation again because Apple made huge margin on these products uh, to make $250 billion cash in their coffers. So Apple did not make money by staying at the level of the disruptive innovation, but moved out into that to create an ecosystem, to create a better product where I believe uh, there is value for me. My colleagues would say there is no value, they go Android, doesn't matter. I, as a client, believe there's value for me, so I pay a high price for this product. So can I identify a similar journey for banks which are going through a disrupted moment uh, because of themselves and because of the challenges they face against the technology players to make sure that they focus into sustaining innovation? They find the way out of that. That is very difficult. So then I'm thinking, do you know of any company that wants to attempt a transformation journey that doesn't go through disruption but follows the red dotted line, like I said before? Well, that company could be Tesla. Because Tesla didn't start by selling a cheap car like a Fiat Panda. <laughs> no way. The Tesla was a very expensive product with a lot of value inside. But what matters to me and mine that this is a very risky business. Sustaining innovation is as risky as disruptive innovation. But Tesla is based upon two things. An electric engine. A new electric engine. So which is uh, the engine of the open banking digital platform? That is the question that we need to ask ourselves. And the second element, when you step into Tesla, you have a computer that streams information to you. Analytics, to make you drive better, to make you feel you're driving better. So which are the analytics that enable you to engage with the new engine of the open banking digital platform to move it forward and give value to the client? There would be artificial intelligence. Because you see, artificial intelligence is not there, like many discuss, to help bankers understand their clients. Who cares understanding you? Well, it is important that banks understand you. But the biggest problem we all have is that we don't understand banks. 
So the value of artificial intelligence today, which is reflected into the conversational banking, the Reserve chatbot you saw in the recent months and years, is the opportunity for banks to learn how to use technology to explain to the clients a new value proposition on a digital platform where relationships are way more in disintermediated. So then what really happens here is that uh, banks can invest into two types of innovation. One is a volume business, disruptive innovation, simple products for the masses, try to make sense out of that, and you will see in the remaining of this uh, presentation, that's a very risky strategy, though it seems very easy to do, because at the end of a volume business transformation, Amazon can be the winner. The alternative is to look at sustaining innovation. How do I create an open banking digital platform that differentiates, that creates a new value so that uh, in front of uh, the technology players, which will be more volume business than me, I can remain afloat and generate value for me and for my clients. So this was the first story. The important message is disruptive innovation is what everybody talks about, but remember, that is not important if you don't find a way out of disruption into sustaining innovation. So we go to the second story. Everything that I discussed needs to happen on digital, but digital is pool. Most of the banking revenues we explained before when we looked at the orange juice operate uh, into a push type of economy. Now, there are people like me that are happy to sit on the coach, put the feet on the table, and let their artificial intelligence decide for them, their money, their investments. But the majority of people out there prefer to talk to a coach instead of sitting on a couch. And this is the reason why even players like uh, Betterman decided to hire human advisors in the end, even Wellfront did that on the phone, because they needed to relate uh, to a psychology of the investor that, largely speaking, that does not allow them to be self-directed exactly where most of the revenues uh, of banks uh, are focusing these days. Now, the fintech, we will see one different fintech later on, thought that uh, they could basically resolve this problem by creating a wonderful customer experience, right? But here and again, customer experience is not important. Sorry, it is important. But customer experience, the way it is defined, typically is a tactical advantage. It is not a strategic advantage. What matters in the long term is the engagement, because the client experience is like the Wi-Fi in a hotel. Ten years ago was new, now everybody has. Some fintech can onboard a client in one hour instead of five days. I expect that all of the banks will do that five years from now. So we need to look at something more fundamental that keeps the client engaged with the digital platform. That is the digital engagement. Now, you remember this movie? This is Lassie Come Home, right? 30 years ago, I already had a beard, I was sitting with mom on the couch and we were hugging each other, just crying because Lassie gets lost, right? And he needs to find his way home. Now, Lassie can find uh, a better home. He can find better food. He can find a better climate, but he wants to get back to his friend because the two of them have something in common. They have a relationship, they are engaged. Now, I'm not inviting the bankers uh, sitting in his room to treat their clients like dogs, <laughs> even though <laughs> dogs <laughs> are wonderful and I love them. What I'm saying is that uh, engagement uh, is way more important strategically when you build a digital platform than the experience itself. And this is super important because as we said, the digital is a pool technology while banking revenues operate in a push economy. I am uh, Italian, my accent, I said, betrays me. I live in Frankfurt, my wife lives in Milano. So every weekend I fly to Milano. And what do I do? My role in the family, I do the grocery. My wife wants me to do the grocery. So Saturday morning, I go to the supermarket, the local Reve, and what do I do? I start pulling products off the shelves into my trolley. I pull my pasta, I pull my bread, Sometimes I pull my German sausages, you know, I got changed. And then I see the advertisement of George Clooney shampooing his beard with a new brand. It's pushed on me and I changed. I buy a new product. But 95% of things I buy are always the same because I know more or less what I want. Grocery is largely a pull mechanism. It would be important we don't have time today to see what is the strategy of Amazon with grocery and AI, but maybe for the next Finestra conference. Now, my friend Dominic never told me, Paolo, let's take a look at what is going on on Amazon. What goes on on Amazon? Nothing, right? You go on Amazon with a purpose. You want to buy one of my books, and then you find somebody else's book. He's okay, right? But just click buy first. <laughs> 
But when you have some money, very few people would know what to look for. Very few people would Google for the next UCTS compliant investment fund that has 30% invested in German stocks between 22 and 23 in Turkish stock and partially invested in Asia. It doesn't really work that way. People need to get into a conversation. They need to talk to somebody because they have a harder time, the majority of people out there, to make cunning financial decisions. This is the heart of the asymmetry of information that you studied at university when I did economics and finance, which has shaped uh, the banking revenues uh, for the last uh, 70 years. Now, what is the symmetry of information? You know South Park? South Park is a US cartoon, and this clip was on American TV in 2009 at the heart of the global financial crisis. So the little kid has some money to invest. He goes to the bank, and he has to make a decision. So I want you to listen carefully to what happens. I got a hundred dollar check from my grandma, and my dad said I need to put it in the bank so it can grow over the years. Well, that's fantastic. A really smart decision, young man. We can put that check in a money market mutual fund. Then we'll reinvest the earnings into foreign currency accounts with compounding interest, and it's gone. What's up, gone? The money in your account. It didn't do too well. It's gone. What do you mean? I, I have a hundred dollars. Not anymore, you don't. Poof. Well, what can I do to get back I'm my- I'm sorry, sir, but this line is for bank members only. I just opened an account. Do you have any money invested with this bank? No, you just lost it all. Then please stand aside for people who actually have money with us. Next, please. <laughs> okay, kind of angst. These things happen all in the US, okay? We are in Germany. <laughs> but the key message here is that, uh, you remember what I said before, the little kid does not understand banking. That's why it needs a conversation. That's why it's very difficult to digitize banks without the proper conversational banking instruction, because people are not largely self-directed, especially in those revenues. You know, mortgages and loans might be slightly different, but it's a different conversation. So then, what happens here is that by talking to somebody, he believes he gets knowledge somehow, or he has to trust knowledge, which makes me to say that the essence of digital is the digitization of knowledge to make sure that uh, your digital strategy generates revenues uh, successfully. Because trust is knowledge. And that's the reason why the title of the presentation today is the digitization of knowledge. Now, when I talk about knowledge digitization, which is very difficult to pronounce for my Italian tongue, uh, people look at me like, Paolo, academia is very theoretical. We are business people. We need to do execution. We need to do something, right? We have technology. That's not the real world. I don't know if you remember the Wolf of Wall Street, Leonardo DiCaprio. Let's share this clip. So Leonardo is explaining to his colleagues uh, how to sell penny stocks on the phone, which is like the digital medium, like 20, 30 years ago. I, I warn you, it's plenty of bad words, OK? <laughs> That's Hollywood. Sorry, uh, I, I appreciate the call. I really have to give this some thought and uh, talk to my wife about it. Um, can I call you back? They don't know, right? They got to think about it. They got to talk to the fucking wives or the fucking tooth fairy. Point is, it doesn't matter what the fuck they say. The only real objection that they have is that they don't trust you guys. And why should they trust you? I mean, look at you. You're a bunch of fucking sleazy salesmen, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> so you heard what happened. The guy doesn't know, even though he doesn't know. Why doesn't he buy from you? Because he doesn't trust you. No trust. Trust is knowledge. That is the essence. If this is not at the heart of your digital strategy, I pretty reassure you that you will not make a return out of investments. So now, of course, uh, some of you may think, uh, if this is the story, forget it. We cannot go digital because trust is generated through a conversation. Conversation is warm. We need to look each other into the eyes, right? Uh, and therefore, there is no way that we can replace that type of uh, mechanism. Mm. You know what? Something is happening. AI is becoming more and more conversational. The day artificial intelligence uh, will be deeply and truly conversational, this phone will go from being pool technology into operating in a push mechanism. And the circle is closed, which is the reason why companies are investing into conversational AI, Alexa, voices, the new marketing, chatbots, and so on and so forth. Now, this cannot happen overnight. It needs to happen in consumption first, uh, 
like Amazon uh, doing groceries, buying on Alexa, before it's transferred into financial services, but a bit at a time, this is somehow happening. So the real transformative value of AI for financial services is not even the analytics, as I said, to understand the client and to do marketing, but is the power to articulate a message that is conveyed to people so that they understand the banking proposition. There's a long way to get there, but for the time being, the value can be given to the bankers themselves because it's about making sure that we can scale their competencies so that they can provide more added value to a larger group of people because somehow they tend to become a bit more volume businesses in a way they can articulate a message which is not about selling products but is about providing advice which is a completely different business that requires a reskilling of people and skilling people is not that easy. So that brings us into the third story. So what did we say so far? We said Disruption is what everybody talks about, but disruption is not that important as long as, at least, you have a way out of disruption into sustaining innovation, which should be the strategy of banks to access open banking digital platforms in the future. The second, this needs to happen on digital, but digital is a pool technology, technology of the demand, while most of the banking revenues through this transformation of the business model operate into the off-driven economy is a push mechanism. Artificial intelligence is that mechanism that becoming deeply and truly conversational can turn digital pull into digital push and the circle is closed. For the time being, we need to use it to augment the capability of people and bankers to relate with a different business model, the provision of advice instead of selling products through transactions. Now, this clearly needs to happen more and more on platforms, so we need to get into the understanding of the bundling versus unbundling problem. You know Breaking Banks. My friend Breaking was with him um, in Tehran last week for uh, an interesting payment conference, and in China a month ago, I was on this Breaking Bank show a couple of years ago. And this is the idea that uh, the fintech can basically attack the banks and break them into smaller pieces, right? Because they can provide sexier, simpler, cleaner solutions that, you know, customers will be inclined to access, you know, because it seems to be better and good. There is a problem. I always told the FinTech, and I'm telling my FinTech friends today again, you cannot break a bank for the simple reason that banks are already broken. <laughs> if you think about it, they operate like different business models, right? Where everybody has his own incentive, they try to do cross-selling, which really never works, right? But in reality, they should be way more client-centric. So the question is, uh, how do I define a strategy where, as I start working with fintech entrepreneurs with new ideas, new technology, new business propositions, I have clearly defined the digital strategy so that in the end, I'm capable of bundling back all together, making sure that I respect the new engine and I use the API and the analytics to aggregate them all together. Well, I need to understand what it means to build a platform. Now, Platforms are important. If you look at the history of the Internet, you realize that the big winners of the World Wide Web uh, transformation are the platforms. What is LinkedIn? And I invite you to join me on LinkedIn. Is the platform for my professional life. What is Facebook? Is the platform for my personal life. What is Amazon? Is the platform for my consumption. What is Twitter? Is the platform for my Trump paranoia. <laughs> but where is uh, the platform uh, for my financial life, uh, whether I am an individual or I am a small entrepreneur? That does not exist. But if I will find uh, a unicorn 20 years from now, that unicorn will be that company which is capable of building a platform that becomes the aggregated financial life platform of the respective customer. What does it mean to create a client-centric digital platform that aggregates the financial life of a small, medium enterprise or an individual like you? Well, it means solving a simple equation. At least this is my personal equation. I don't know about yours. You see it up there. I earn money because I work for IBM. It is not enough. I need to sell books. Okay? Minus what I pay, digital payments these days, equals what I save. If I'm smart in saving, I can invest. I can also lend and borrow, maybe on a peer-to-peer -peer platform. 
I can donate money, I can do retirement, I can insure myself. Now, the fact is that this equation is very simple, but if I look at my wallet, and when I'm in China, I say, if I look at my wallet, <laughs> because money is all here, I don't have enough money to do everything I want. And when dad gave me the CD player 25 years ago, he said, Paolo, save for retirement. Now I'm 50, I'm like, I didn't save for retirement. So my persona changes, right? my preferences, so as I go through my life cycle, it's all different. Now look at these verbs. These are the pillars of a broken bank. You've got investment management, you've got insurance, you've got uh, saving, right? You've got uh, the payment mechanisms, so on and so forth. Think about the fintech. They made a huge mistake again to simplify into well tech, pay tech, credit tech, insure tech, but it's client tech because the client is at the center. And if I want the client to pay to access the platform, I need to give him Amazon Prime. But I don't pay for Amazon Prime if I can only buy Paolo Cerrone's books, which are good. <laughs> I want to get more products there, right? So I need to be able to understand how to create client centricity along these pillars and transform the way people pay for banking services by paying the access to the platform instead of making money by letting them pay through commissions in the individual products. There's another important element here on this, uh, uh, we don't see it, on this equation is that um, where am I every day, where are you every day, is basically on the left side of this equation. You work, you're here working, is this working, right? Minus what you pay, digital payment, we know that the margin will be zero. But where are the products or the mechanisms uh, that the bank uses to make money? They're all on the right side of the equation. Right? The investment products, the insurance products. So AI can also help you to move uh, clients around the left side of the equation into the right side of the equation and an ongoing onboarding mechanism that follows the client through his life journey, mixing banking products and non-banking products, which is the way to create an engagement that makes the platform always relevant in front of people. Because you see what happens is that I was actually here in Frankfurt three years ago when we made this uh, idea with Efe Pilarino, which I, I say hi Efe if uh, she will ever follow this uh, presentation, because she said that uh, banks uh, are the sharks, uh, so the insurance companies, if there are any insurance people here. And fintech are the piranhas that are attacking the banks. That was three, four years ago. Now, I don't know if I prefer to swim with the sharks or the piranhas in the ocean, right, or in the lake. It's difficult to say. But the point is that uh, this is not the real competition because the idea is really to build a platform and an ecosystem where everybody can work together to create a new level of services which are way more client-centric. Because if banks and insurance companies together with the fintech don't manage to do that, you know what, the fisherman comes. The tech fin, as Jackman said, the big uh, owners of digital platforms which are out there and which, in case you want to build volume businesses, inviting your clients to go digital, will be way more effective than you in creating client engagement that matters on a banking charter that becomes more and more commoditized. Now, where do we see these uh, mind-blowing examples that try to indicate how to mix banking and non-banking products to aggregate people on the digital platform is China. Do you, oops, do you know WeChat? How many of you have a WeChat account? Raise the hand. Okay, a few. Now, WeChat is uh, a super army knife uh, of the platformification of China because it contains uh, so many different companies with the mini apps that is aggregating the old world. So it goes beyond the concept of the platform. It's the platform of the old platforms. I want you to watch these uh, short movies, four minutes, uh, taken from the... Um, actually, let me, let me just do this. I think I, I, I cut it briefly. Let me extend it, yes. There we are. Okay, which is taken by the New York Times, right? Because it gives you an understanding of what is happening in China, and then we get back to this conversation, okay? We watch it. If you are sitting in the United States or Europe right now, you've probably never used a Chinese app. But the reality is, if you want to know how the internet will develop, China, the land once known for its cheap ripoffs, has actually become a guide to the future. You know, the internet is the internet. 
but for China, the internet is more like an intranet. It's largely walled off from the Western world by this incredibly complex system of filters and blocks that we call the Great Firewall. And basically, the Great Firewall blocks any foreign site the Communist Party doesn't think it can control. So that means there is no Facebook, no Twitter, no Google. Instead, what filled the internet vacuum was a generation of Chinese copycats that have grown into huge companies. So for Google, you had Baidu. For YouTube, you had Yoku. For Twitter, you had Sina Weibo. And the list goes on and on. It's almost as if the Chinese internet is a lagoon as an aside to the greater ocean of the internet. And in that lagoon, there are these swamp monster apps that bear some resemblance to the creatures in the ocean, but are mutated in some ways because they evolved in a different kind of environment. But things have started to shift in the sense that before, no one outside of the lagoon really cared about the swamp monsters. But now, all of a sudden, some of the features they've developed are so amazing that Western apps are trying to copy them. And the greatest example of this is WeChat. WeChat is an example of, uh, for lack of a better word, a super app. It's a Swiss army knife that basically does everything for you. It's your WhatsApp, Facebook, Skype, and Uber. It's your Amazon, Instagram, Venmo, and Tinder. But it's other things we don't even have apps for. There are hospitals that have built out whole appointment booking systems. There are investment services. There are even heat maps that show how crowded a place is, be it your favorite shopping mall or a popular tourist site. The list of services goes on basically forever. But it's not the variety of things you can do on WeChat that makes it so powerful. It's the fact that they're all in one app. So why does that matter? Hypothetically, imagine you're sitting at home and one day you notice your corgi is dirty. You open WeChat, hit a few buttons, and a few hours later a man shows up at your door with some shampoo and a big vacuum. Your dog gets cleaned and he looks great. You take a photo, you share it with your friends, and tag the dog cleaning business. You haven't left the app. Your friend who likes Hello Kitty and works a boring office job is slacking off at work and looking at WeChat. She sees the photo of your clean corgi. She decides she wants her poodle clean. She clicks the tag on your photo and orders the same service. Within seconds, the man with the big vacuum is on his way to her house. She pays him, and he's happy because he got paid instantly on WeChat. She starts chatting with you to thank you. Neither of you have left the app. While chatting, she tells you about a new hip noodle joint. She says, you have to come. It's a schlep, but you accept. She orders food while still at her desk. You order a taxi. She pays for the food. On the way to her house, the man with the big vacuum invests the money he earned from both of you into a wealth management product that's probably a little too risky. Neither of you nor the man with the big vacuum have left the app. Both of you arrive and the app tells the kitchen you're there. Your WeChat profile photo pops up on the wall. It's an old photo from the year you had that weird part in your hair. Of course she makes a comment. Your food is served. You notice your meat is a bit overcooked, so you snap a photo and post a disparaging restaurant review. You're already on your phone, and you remember you still owe your friend money because she paid. You transfer her money. Neither of you, the man with the big vacuum, nor the restaurant have left the app. At the restaurant, there are no menus, there are no waiters, there is no cashier. There is only WeChat. By rolling so many functions into one single app, it's altered the concept of virality. It's no longer just videos or images or tweets that can go viral. It's a dog washer, noodles, all sorts of companies and products that get the push of a social network. Here in China, that network is 700 million people. Sounds great, right? Well, it is, but using a single app to find a date, schedule an oil change, or notarize a document also enables WeChat to collect a staggering volume of personal data. They know what you talk about, who you talk about it with, what you read, where you go, why you're going there, who's there, how you spend money when you're online, how you spend money when you're offline. The list goes on indefinitely. For advertisers, this is a miracle. It's the combined data of Facebook, Amazon, Google, and PayPal, all in one place. The problem is, all of the data is information Chinese companies are forced to share with the Chinese government, which has a long record of human rights violations and isn't exactly shy about stalking its citizens. So if you're not in China, why does this matter? It matters because we're starting to see a number of Western tech companies attempt to replicate super apps like WeChat. For the companies, it's incredibly powerful. And for you and me, it's a convenient and even transformative technology. But of course, it could also be problematic. 
Concentrating so much data in so few hands could lay the groundwork for an Orwellian world where companies and governments can track every single movement you make. Fascinatingly scaring in a sense. I was in China again three weeks ago for a preview of my for book on transparency. I had to get money to a friend to put money on my WeChat wallet because I cannot connect my MasterCard because it would not work in China because I couldn't buy the train ticket. Otherwise, you're disconnected from the world. And that matters to me because there is an O2O -O mechanism. WeChat is more powerful than Facebook because if I don't have Facebook, I can put my picture somewhere else. But if I cannot pay, I'm in big troubles. So then, you know this is my WeChat profile and this is my Facebook profile. So you see my Facebook profile is a good experience. The pictures are big, uh, I can do trimming of the videos, I can add some you know, bigger noses to my faces and so forth. That doesn't really happen on WeChat. They add the trimming of the videos only like a uh, um, few months ago, seven or eight months ago. The, the video cannot be longer than 10 seconds, makes no much sense. But the engagement, the engagement that WeChat created is way more powerful because they started from conversations, they added payments, and they started aggregating the whole economy. So then, to conclude the presentation today, this is Gini Rometti, the CEO of IBM. Last year, I think a conference in Las Vegas, actually our think conference this year is uh, next week in San Francisco. And Gini hosted uh, in a conference which is like this one, we had 30,000 delegates. Jay McKay, Dave McKay, who's the CEO of Royal Bank of Canada. And she asked Dave, what is the value on digital? What is the value of your job on digital? So I want you to listen to what Dave McKay answered to this question. Trying to create value not only for customers, but for our employees who serve those customers, bringing mobility, bringing advice, bringing insight into data, yeah. knowledge, value and that's the equation Th this, that we're trying to okay knowledge is value that's why the title of the presentation today on open banking digital platforms is the digitization of knowledge to scale competencies so what did we say today to conclude the first message was disruptive innovation might be relevant but make sure you have a way out of disruption otherwise you go nowhere amazon WeChat, uh, PayPal, they come and they take your clients. Second message, remember the digital is a pool technology. Most of the banking revenues that matter today in the Western world operate in a push economy. When AI will be truly and deeply conversational, digital will go from pool to being push mechanism and the circle is closed. And the third message, you can't unbundle back. Only platforms win on digital so that you need to find a way to create uh, that open banking digital platform that uses non-banking products to create continuous engagement so that with AI you can move the banking product in front of the client and continue your business. Most of this you find in the FinTech Innovation Book. If you want to connect on LinkedIn, that's my QR code. Now I know that most of you don't know that you can use a QR code with LinkedIn, but you basically can if you open up your phone and you Take a picture of this one, we connect to my LinkedIn account. You can reach out to IBM, I'm here with colleagues, Jürgen Lang is here in the audience, or you can go to my uh, website as an author, thepcronde.com, for more information. Thank you for hosting me.